Hello, I'm Julia Kim and you're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. Here are the top stories today on the continent. Kenya's education minister dissolves the school board at a Nairobi girls' school following the rape of a 15-year-old student. Ethiopia announces it will fully accept and implement a peace deal with Eritrea signed in 2000. The decision could bring an end to a dispute that sparked Africa's deadliest border war in 1998. And as the UN wages war on plastic waste for World Environment Day, France 24's reporters looks at how Ivory Coast is struggling to give up plastic bags. But first, Kenya's Ministry of Education has fired administrators at the Moy Girls Boarding School in Nairobi after a student there was raped. The incident has sparked outrage among parents who held protests demanding more security for their daughters. All male staff members have been ordered to undergo DNA testing as part of the investigation. The 15-year-old was sexually abused in her dormitory on Saturday, while two other girls were physically assaulted. Carolyn Thompson is in Nairobi following that story for us. She had this update. The Cabinet Secretary of Education has implemented changes in response to allegations that a 15-year-old girl was sexually assaulted at Moy Girls School, uh, an all-girls school here in Nairobi, Kenya's capital city, on the weekend. Now, these changes include dismantling the school board, uh, as well as the parent-teacher council, the early retirement of the head teacher, as well as bringing in some extra security. A preliminary report said that there were security gaps noted uh, at the school site. Now, this comes uh, after allegations that the girls who were the victims of this alleged incident were told by staff at the school to cover it up. They say when they came to the teachers, they were told not to say anything. That raised an outcry. Parents and students went to the school earlier this week to protest and demand answers. Now, the school has been shut down for a week and police are investigating. They have asked male staff and teachers to provide DNA. This is not the first incident at this school. Last year, uh, uh, almost a dozen girls were killed in a fire that went through one of the dormitories. And ultimately, this is raising questions uh, among a lot of people about whether or not sending girls to this institution is safe. Well, Ethiopia's ruling coalition has announced it will fully accept and implement a peace treaty with Eritrea signed in 2000. The move would definitively end the war between the two neighbours, which killed tens of thousands of people. Two years of bloodshed in 1998 eventually ended in a hostile stalemate over the border town of Badme. A UN-backed commission granted the land to Eritrea as a condition of the Algiers peace agreement. But Ethiopia rejected the decision. Until now. Well, joining us from Newcastle is Awol Allo, law lecturer at Newcastle's Kiel University. Thank you very much for joining us on the programme. Now, it's been 20 years since the start of this conflict. How devastating has this border war been for Eritrea and Ethiopia? Oh, it was absolutely devastating. It's a war that's posted close to uh, 100,000 people uh, on both sides. Uh, it was devastating for the economy of the country. Uh, for the last 20 years, the two countries have not been talking. They have no economic relationship. But even more than that, they have been destabilizing each other's uh, country. So these have been extremely devastating, uh, both politically, socially, and also uh, economically for those, both countries. So the decision today, I think, is hugely consequential uh, for the two countries, but also for the broader region. And what do you think, uh, now that Ethiopia has made this announcement, what do you think Eritrea is likely to do now? So since the decision was handed down, Ethiopia actually never uh, officially uh, rejected the, the Boundary Commission's decision. It, it said it uh, accepted the formal uh, decision, uh, but it uh, presented some pretexts arguing that uh, when it comes to demarcating the decision on the ground, there has to be some compromise, there has to be some discussion. And the Eritrean government used that as a pretext to reject uh, any discussion, any talks uh, between the two countries. So the Eritrean government for the last 20 years have been insisting on Ethiopia's full compliance with the decision. Now Ethiopia has agreed to fully comply with the decision. The ball is really in Eritrea's court. Um, it's not clear whether the Eritrean government will actually accept and implement the decision because you know, the problem between the two countries is not really about the border disputes. That's, that's uh, land, uh, 
uh, is entirely insignificant. It's certainly not something that two countries could go into a war to, uh, you know, pay all those sacrifices. So there are broader uh, political problems between the two countries. And I think Eritrean government needs the existence of these security threats coming from Ethiopia in order to legitimize and justify uh, its existence, uh, to um, keep the kind of control it has over the population. So we'll see how this will play out, but the ball is in the court now. Okay, thank you very much. I will allow there, reporting to us from Liverpool, uh, from Newcastle, sorry. Thank you very much for that. Well, Ethiopia's new leader also seems to be restoring peace among his own people. This Tuesday, lawmakers vowed to voted rather to lift a state of emergency. The previous administration had imposed martial law back in February in response to deadly anti-government protests. Two and a half years of clashes led to hundreds of deaths and arrests, mainly in the rest of Aromia region, where the new premier hails from. Now, after being elected in April, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed freed thousands of protesters, dramatically reducing tensions in the country. Eliminating plastic waste is the theme of this year's World Environment Day. According to the UN, microplastics in our seas now outnumber stars in our galaxy. It estimates at least 4.4 million tonnes of plastic annually is dumped into the oceans around Africa. In Rwanda, a 2008 blanket ban on plastic bags has been largely successful. But in the Ivory Coast, a similar measure from 2013 has yet to take off. Leanne Bassompierre, Thais Brook and Isabel Coffey report. The use of plastic bags is a way of life Ivorians seem to have a hard time shrugging off. Plastic everywhere and even plastic bags for sale. We know it's forbidden, but what can we do? They told us about biodegradable bags, but we can't find any more. They stopped selling them too. We have to start selling the same bags again. In the covered market of Ajami, even vegetables can't escape the use of plastic. Vendors here too are fighting alternatives. We use them because we have not yet found other solutions. If we are offered something else, we are ready to change our habits. In Ivory Coast, four years after the ban, only supermarkets and pharmacies have banned their use. Government is therefore taking advantage of World Environment Day to reinforce its campaign of an Ivory Coast without plastic bags. The government has taken matters into their own hands. People were imprisoned and tried because they illegally made plastic water packaging. As well as sanctioning people, we intensify our campaign to encourage people to give up using these plastic bags. These sachets of water described by the minister are still on sale at every corner. They regularly block the city's sewage system, causing floods and, as a result, waterborne diseases. The use of plastic bags is so entrenched in daily life, it will take years before Ivory Coast can get rid of them. And finally, Rwandan activists have slammed the government's decision to close hundreds of churches and mosques. They say it violates freedom of worship and expression. But the government says the measures are designed to stop charlatan preachers from preying on the vulnerable. The shutdowns have mainly targeted small makeshift prayer houses. Officials say only 700 of the 15,000 churches in Rwanda are registered. Maud Julien has this report. The most popular session at Patmos Church in Rwanda's capital, Kigali, is the afternoon miracle service. Self-titled prophet and founder of the church, Jean Bosco Nsabimana, says he can cure illness, poverty and even demons. His is one of the few churches that were not closed down. We recognize that the government was a little forceful on the closure of churches, but on the other hand, this has also forced churches to comply and ensure that they build adequate structures. Rwanda's authorities say the move was aimed at making sure places of worship meet safety and noise pollution standards and at stemming fraud. It accuses some preachers of taking advantage of vulnerable people to grow rich. But many say that while there was indeed a need for more regulation, the shutdown was too abrupt a measure from which smaller, poorer places of worship may never recover. I think it is better now for our authority to think and uh, to see whether they can facilitate us uh, and uh, use our mosque without putting 
very hard conditions. Activists and some followers say the regulations violate freedom of expression and religious rights. You cannot tell someone to lead a full life when he has no income or is without the church. It will be difficult. The government needs to know that our spiritual life is important if it wants peace with us. A new law should soon make it compulsory to undergo theological training before opening a church. Rwanda's president says the country needs less churches and more wells. And that's it for me and from the Eye on Africa desk. We're back with you soon. More news coming right up. Stay tuned to France 24.